this is a grandparent interview for Fionn and Bromwyn with my mum and dad, Brenda and Russell Blindford, that was my maiden name. And today is Good Friday 2016 and we're at home in Seaton and we're about to move house hopefully in a few weeks and we've just had a really big dinner so we'll try not to fall asleep while we're doing this and I'm going to ask them lots of questions about their past and hopefully they'll remember some funny things to tell you. So the first one is, what great memories do you have of your school days? Well, my first school was Bracken Road Infant School and everyone walked to school in those days. Nobody went to school in cars. We always walked, whatever the weather. My favourite time of the week was Friday afternoons when we were allowed to take in toys and we just had a free afternoon to play. That was a really lovely time. Very happy memories. And my happy memories of school probably were of junior school more than uh, grammar school because by the time I got to grammar school uh, Pretty fed up with school. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, junior school was much more relaxed and uh, uh, but particularly she loved was running back and forth because we used to uh, live only half a mile away from the school. But uh, coming home for lunch uh, in the pouring rain, my wellies, <laughs> my poor wellies, we should run all the way home and it come back with red rings around my shins where the red well has been rubbing. <laughs> uh, there was one occasion then I was particularly proud of in uh, junior school. Um, we were going to do a play at Christmas time. And throughout my school days I was a fairly shy boy really, I still am I suppose. <laughs> Yes. And um, <laughs> anyway, the teacher was wanted various pupils to uh, take the parts within this play and it reached a stage where the main part, the king, uh, had to be chosen and she wanted everyone in the class to take it in turns and to stand up and recite a couple of lines she found and extracted from the play. Most of the people, most of the pupils in the class mumbled and were very, very shy. And as I say, I was particularly shy, but for some reason, when I was handed a sheet of paper, I just let rip. <laughs> and really bellowed out the lines, which really not took her back and lo and behold there I was from that day on the king of the play <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say it went quite well the whole of the play I was lying perfect until sort of three or four paragraphs from the end of the play when someone asked me a question and I by then had switched off <laughs> I didn't realise that it was my line next and there was this massive pregnant pause and this good your line, your line and I just started taking in the scenery by then because I thought it finished <laughs> so it didn't quite go perfectly but uh, reasonably well okay. What school was that? Pant Junior School It's easy to say it than some other yeah. Welsh words What school did you go to after that? After that, we went to Gavartha Castle Ooh. Grammar School, <laughs> which I, I suppose had its benefits because it was the best school in the borough. Oh, no, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> County far, Grammar was the best. Far school. superior to County, County grammar. grammar School, where my, brother, my elder brother went. Why did you go to a different school? Well, we never really understood them. I mean, my mother protested that it uh, didn't make any sense. Uh, the fact that 
uh, one of the boys in my class, his elder brother was already in Cavarton Castle School. My brother was in County Castle School. So what did they do? They allocated me to Cavarton Castle School and David went to County. So we said, well, can't you just swap them over? And let the two brothers attend the same school, and for some whatever reason, the local authority said no, they didn't allocate it, and that's the end of that. But I suppose I ended up uh, with, 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 with the best uh, deal out of it. Oh, no. <laughs> the, the main attraction was the Kamatha Castle School, it was a, an old Iron Masters mansion set in uh, a parkland. So, uh, the school buses for a long time were never allowed inside the park, so we'd be dropped at the gates and we'd have something like a quarter of a mile walk from the gates up to the school through the park, and which uh, was something special every day. Mm -hmm. We didn't appreciate it until uh, we'd really finished the school. Other than that, I hated grammar school. <laughs> Why? Well, I always wanted to do something work in my hands. Uh, I always want, always uh, aspired to have a trade. And um, when I left junior school, uh, my mother had asked, you know, why can't you go to a secondary modern school where they would teach you, teach you skills uh, such as mechanical skills and. Uh, maybe carpentry or stuff like that and uh, the headmaster said no he said uh, he's too bright and I'm probably not he's too, he's too he's too bright to go to second anymore he, he should go to grammar school but uh, you know it was a bit of a challenge uh, in particular they'd streamed our year group to do uh, an experiment where we were to do our A level, uh, sorry, our O levels in four years rather than five. And that meant cramming everything in. And uh, I suppose I really wasn't prepared for that. Perhaps in my particular example, the experiment was a bit of a failure. Especially when it came to trying to do five languages simultaneously. Not your strong point then? Never was my strong point. As you will gather later on in this interview, memory is one of my weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to trying to memorise five different vocabularies simultaneously, <laughs> I really didn't have much of a chance. I was just there to be shot down. Uh, what was it like growing up in your home? Well, Pretty strict, I think, in my case. Uh, your mother was very strict. My mother was very strict. My father, oh, yeah. laid back. my father was laid back and didn't uh, take much of an active part disciplining children. My mother more or less ruled the house. <laughs> what was what were their names? Uh, my mother was uh, Margaret Elizabeth Megan by nickname, and my father was Hugh, known as Huey. Um, he, my mother stayed at home and looked after the, the family. Uh, he was a, a baker working in a factory, made uh, cakes, uh, and he worked very, very long hours, so we didn't see an awful lot of him uh, through most of the week. Uh, even on weekends he'd be working, so he'd come home, he'd have his food, and he'd be so shattered that uh, before very long he'd be fast asleep in the chair. But uh, they uh, were regular attendees at uh, Sunday school, uh, at the Baptist chapel, and we were brought up in the Baptist uh, belief. And we used to go to chapel three times on a Sunday, never allowed out to play on a Sunday. Balls and bats and the such like were taboo. What did you do instead? Go to chapel. <laughs> well, you just read or colour or 
Mm. Like that. And he would go and visit Auntie Lydia and Uncle Dave and get sweets. Yes. I'm over to my uh, aunt's across the road. And that was always a Sunday ritual, just to say hello. She liked to uh, spoil us by giving us sweets. And my uncle used to tease us mercilessly. <laughs> mercilessly and, uh, yes. And you had three brothers, uh, two brothers? Two brothers, one elder, Malcolm, one younger, Clive. Uh, Malcolm was more of a studious type. Clive and I were more sporty and we'd spend most of our time uh, up on the uh, playground, which is only three or four hundred yards up the road. Malcolm would be there uh, playing chess and uh, he used to organise things for his school, uh, playing with tape recorders and cameras and things like that. Uh, whenever they had special events on, uh, I think he was a bit of a teacher's pet, mm -hmm. the drama teacher. <laughs> so we were always quarrelling. Uh, so you didn't get off anyway. Well, we just like other, you know, all. Uh, all siblings quarrel. Quarrel, quarrel quite a bit. Could mm -hmm. mainly because he cheated at everything when he did <laughs> join in. We had to cheat. And you had to sleep in the same bed? And we slept in the same bed. And uh, that became a bit of a problem after a number of years because the middle of the bed sagged. <laughs> so I was stuck in the middle between the two of them and uh, a bit of an effort trying to get out of the, the pothole in the middle of the bed. <laughs> so how, how old were you before you got separate beds? <laughs> 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 what about you, Mum? <laughs> well, I had an older brother, Donald, and uh, we had a very happy upbringing, quite simple life, really. My earliest recollections of uh, happy times with my father were that he had a motorbike and sidecar and Occasionally he'd let me ride on the back on the pillion, which was quite exciting. And one year he took me and John and my mum, Grace, to Horn Church in Essex, all the way in a sidecar, you know, double-seated sidecar. <laughs> no motorways in those days, so I took all the day from breakfast to supper time. We lived very close to my grandparents and uh, spent a lot of time with them. Very simple lifestyle, really. Used to play cards a lot, fun playing cards. Who did that today? Dad was George and my mum was Grace. And so that's not a first name, is it? No. She had three names, Minnie, Sylvia, Grace, but when she was named Minnie, nobody in the family liked it, apart from her mother. So she was called Grace, always called Grace. <laughs> and what principles did they bring you up with? Always to be kind to one another, treat each other as you would like to be treated, and always to believe he was good as anyone else, no matter what station in life they were, everyone was equal. And in my case, uh, probably honesty was a major. Uh, major uh, thing that they would look for, hard working uh, and sharing things, they would uh, encourage us to share 
be generous to each other. Take note, Fiona and Bromley. <laughs> what did you do in the years after school? What did you do once you finished school? When I finished school, I went to work as a trainee dispenser in Boots of Kenneth. Worked there for three years in River Tidville till I married Russell. We went to live in Loughborough for a year, so they transferred to Boots in Loughborough. So was that after Roland? Oh yes, after Roland. And then, um, after Loughborough, moved back to Merthyr, another year in Boots of Kenneth, and then took a secretarial course and pursued administration there. My father went from A levels to university in Liverpool. Yes, he did a four year sandwich course in production engineering and management. Uh, I was sponsored through university by what used to be Stewart's and Lloyd's in Corby, which is just down the road from here. Uh, then before I joined, they were taken over by the British Steel Corporation. So I was a student apprentice with them. So one term on the summer holidays. In each of the years at the university would be spent working in the, in the uh, steel plant with them trying to gain uh, experience, practical experience. Uh, finished in living here now? Yes, yeah, a strange coincidence, but a small it's, world. It's turned to full yeah. circle. Cause I keep bumping into people who say they, uh, they're familiar with Loughborough. Yeah, so I met one uh, this last week, but uh, yeah. he'd been at uh, Loughborough University as well. What's the worst trouble you got into and why? I was never in trouble. I was perfectly fluent in July. Never got in trouble. No way of verifying that, am I? <laughs> you have to take my word for it. <laughs> you agree with that, Dad? Well, she's been in trouble with me a few times. <laughs> but you shan't mention things like that. Are you going to tell them when you were in trouble? Well, the worst time I was in trouble, or the worst offence, <laughs> uh, was uh, a drunken evening at uh, Loughborough University. We'd been up at the, the uh, Saturday night dance, probably, and uh, we were walking home. Uh, Dave Parvitt, Scott's friend of mine, roommate, and we were so late leaving the bar that the um, they had a bit of a you know, uh, snack bar uh, where you could get food after a certain time. But by the time we had left the university, the snack bar had already closed. We were ravenously starving, so we were walking home and. In one of the streets, <laughs> led us back to the hall of residence. There was an apple tree. So we walked past this apple tree. <laughs> no kebab shop then. No, no kebab kebabs shop. in those days. <laughs> so one of us, I can't remember which, it was probably Dave, probably it wouldn't have been me, would it? Uh, said, oh, let's have some apples, let's fancy some apples, let's have some apples. So rather than pick any apples up off the floor, which would be, you know, a reasonable thing to do. We decided, right, he had this big PVC black coat, which was all the rage in those days, with massive pockets. So, you might want he... To tell him what you no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, he said, right, I'll stand on the corner here and keep an eye out. You go up the tree and get some apples and so I was up the tree and uh, stuffing apples in the pockets 
No, well, well, yeah, more, wanted more than half a dozen in any case, I don't know, but anyway, pockets were full. Next thing, he shouted, Look out, look out, police car coming. <laughs> so, jumped off the tree and uh, started walking down the street quite nonchalantly. <laughs> the police car passed the top end of the street. And uh, we thought, oh, we got away with that. But it only went 50 yards past <laughs> us, and all of a sudden it swung round. We looked, and we thought, oh, oh. So we dashed into the first available drive and hid behind the hedge. So within a couple of minutes, this policeman was standing looking over the hedge, asking us, and what are you, pair up to <laughs> hiding behind there? <laughs> so anyway, uh, it turned out that the owners of the house uh, had seen us in the tree. They'd phoned the police. Anyway, uh, they took all our details and uh, they told us we had to attend the police station uh, the following day, which is Saturday. So down we went. So we were torn off a strip by the, the local <laughs> sergeant. Can you believe that? <laughs> it wouldn't happen these days. Yeah. It wouldn't certainly not. And he do. said he's issuing us with uh, a formal caution, which meant that uh, if we committed any offences within the six month period, then uh, that would, I would leave this particular offence would be taken into account. What, well, picking apples from picking the tree? Apples apples. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we did, we did, we did the, uh, we did the right thing afterwards. And we, we went back to the, the property in question, knocked on the door, and uh, we stood there humbly apologising for our stupidity. <laughs> but yeah, that was the worst. That was Fiona Brown, like the story of you getting the cane, though. Yes, they were fascinated with canes in school, weren't they? <laughs> I mean, that, to me, it wasn't, you know, I, th I thought it was totally unjust in this Because I think all that had happened was we, I was in class one day and there was one of, the, one of the chairs was in the front of the class rather than behind the desk. So, rather than carry the chair, as you would normally expect, I kind of kicked and slid the chair down the gap between the desks, kind of showing off, you know, they could get through the gap. The only problem was, as I actually did this, in split-second timing, the headmaster was walking past the door of the class. And the uh, next thing, I was up in his office and I was receiving a cane for abusing the school furniture. Ouch. That wouldn't happen these days either. That's <laughs> a bit harsh. Yeah. So how did, did you... Didn't do it. <laughs> so how did you meet? Have you got the same version of this story or is it two different versions? I think we've got the same version. As... Uh, Dad said earlier we were in rival grammar schools and we first met at a friend's birthday party and I went home with someone else and Dad went home with someone else. But then about six months later we met at a dance that was organised by the rival grammar schools. So we had a joint Save the Children Fund committee we used to organise dances once a month. So we both went to this dance and he asked me to dance and then later in the evening he came and asked me for another dance and then asked if anyone was walking me home. Fortunately he was the first one to ask me that evening so I said <laughs> yes uh, you're welcome to take me home. And that was the start of a long and loving relationship. Is that the same version? Same version? Yes, pretty much so. Yeah. Yeah, I was quite jealous of uh, of John when he started uh, taking it out. I thought, 
He's not good enough for her. <laughs> How old are you? Sixteen. Seven. <laughs> so the song and the sound of music. Yeah. Yeah. I am sixteen. Mm -hmm. so innocent as a rose. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So my one and only. When did you get married? I was twenty. Dad was 21. Yes, I'd, uh, I'd been at Loughborough for three years. I'd been at Loughborough for three years and uh, travelling back and forth was a bit of a strain. So uh, one day I suggested that uh, we might get married. I proposed. Mm -hmm. Oh, I asked. Uh, I did the right thing, yes, didn't I? Yes, asked, my father. I asked the father for permission first. And uh, thankfully he said yes, by all means, you have a... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we decided then that uh, we'd get married before I finished the course and uh, then they would come up and we'd find somewhere to live in Loughborough for, for the last year. Because in those days, you either got married or you stayed with your parents. You didn't go and live with anyone. So yes, we were, I was 20 and Dad was 21 when we got married and went to live in Loughborough. Before you got married, though, you had a bit of an adventure trying to see each other, didn't you? When you were at university. Uh, Travelling from Loughborough was a bit difficult for you, wasn't it? You didn't have a car. Well, I didn't have a car. Eventually, my brother, who was at Leicester University, he had a car, so um, he used to, in the, the latter year, or two years, he used to uh, drive me home. But uh, I remember the very first occasion, um, I'd been at Loughborough probably for about four or six weeks. And he was missing me. And most of the other students, you know, they pop home for a weekend. So they talk about hitchhiking. You know, I've never hitchhiked in my life. So having sought some advice how to set about doing this and uh, buying myself a map, I decided, right, I'm going to hitchhike back to Wales. Uh, I decided not to tell them that this had given a surprise. <laughs> so off I went learning the best ways of hitchhiking as I went because uh, it didn't go according to plan. Uh, I kind of zigzagged my way uh, from Loughborough down to South Wales. Partly say. because stuck by, by standing in, in the wrong position on some roundabouts and uh, ending up travelling in the wrong direction. <laughs> I got down as far, I think I got as far down south as um, Stratford and I was standing on a roundabout and I'd been there probably for an hour waiting for a lift and this lorry driver asked me where I was going and I said to South Wales, he said, oh, um, I'll drop you off in Bromsgrove. I think he must have said it for a joke because Bromsgrove, Bromsgrove was back north again. And he said, yeah, great. So I jumped in his <laughs> lorry and lo and behold, there I was heading north <laughs> to be dropped off at another roundabout in, uh, in Bromsgrove. So in all, it took me the best part of 10 hours to hitchhike. <laughs> uh, what was probably a four hour journey. So I got home. My father was totally amazed when they walked through the door and said, what are you doing here? Because I hadn't told him either that I was going to go. So I just popped over and surprise we came. So I dropped my bag, got the bus, straight down to Brenda's house, knocked on the door. Mother was amazed. What are you doing here? I come over to see Brenda. She's not here. What do you mean she's not here? She's in Bristol. <laughs> So there I was, <laughs> outside my girlfriend's house, and she'd gone and deserted me. 
I didn't know you were coming. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I went home, poked it. <laughs> anyway, fortunately, the following day, my uh, uncle offered to drive me down. There were no buses on a Sunday, so he took me down in his car to, to see Brenda. We had uh, a couple of hours together, and then uh, he volunteered to uh, give me a lift home. I thought he meant going back home. Uh, back to Dowlais, but uh, actually he set off and drove me as far as Worcester, which was uh, more than halfway back to Lepers. That was a, a big help. So the return journey wasn't as arduous as the uh, the journey down. And that was the first and last time he ever came down without telling me. <laughs> mm. First lesson then. Yeah, first lesson then. When did you get married? When? Mm. In 1971. I was 20. Dad was 21. Whereabouts? In Park Baptist Church in River Tidville. On a lovely sunny September morning. And we went on honeymoon to Ibiza, my first time to fly in an aeroplane. Did you enjoy that? No, <laughs> I'll be nervous. Never got over it. <laughs> Never got over it. <laughs> what were the early years of marriage like? It wasn't easy for me because it was our first year of marriage was spent in Loughborough and it was my first time ever away from home. Whereas Dad already had a group of friends through the university and he was quite happy with his uh, group and social life in the university was, I felt a little bit of an outsider. But it was a, a good sort of basis for our marriage. It made us stronger and worked together through it, didn't it? Mm. So how long have you been married now? 45 years this year. And counting? And still counting. What's the secret? Telling each other every day how much we love each other and value each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. Always grateful for him. Always looking out for each other. Back again, back to sharing things, sharing uh, responsibility, sharing what and, it is. And, and giving each other space as well to do what they like to do. So Realising, yeah. Uh, each other's needs. Mm. What about becoming parents? Well, that was a mistake. <laughs> 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 if we'd known what was in front of us, we probably would have gone down a different path. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so unfair. <laughs> When I say mistake, it wasn't a mistake. <laughs> it, it was, it was the wrong choice. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd be married five years before you had me. Yeah. I think Daddy would have waited longer, but I was ready to start a family. Yeah, you started to get broody, didn't you? Yeah. By then, most of our friends had started families, and you know what it's like. Once a one has a one, and they all get jealous. And Carol was born in the heat wave of 1976. Yeah. We were just so lucky that we had the best around it. Mm. So what was it like being a parent for the first time? What can you remember? I remember thinking the books didn't tell me she would behave like this. I remember reading books thinking, well, you feed them and put them down and that's where they would stay to the next feed, but it didn't quite work out like that. I felt when I'd had Caro, she was a perfect little baby, always quiet, never crying. Still perfect. Until I got her home. <laughs> I thought she was the most beautiful baby I'd ever seen. I'm so proud that I'd had a daughter in the male dominated Blanford family. <laughs> And uh, 
Why did you call me Karen? It was the only name that we both agreed that we loved. And it came from the Welsh verb Cari, which means to love. And but there was no instant decision. It took a long time to... Uh, no, she was only a day old. And, you know, we had sort of chosen few names beforehand. But, uh, she was actually just a day old when we decided on Cara. And uh, Nana Grace couldn't pronounce it because she was a cockney. She found it quite difficult to say Cara. But she learned it. <laughs> And then Mark came along? And Mark came along and he was actually five days old before we named him. Because I wanted Michael and your father wanted Stephen, so we <laughs> ended up calling him Mark. So neither of us had a one. That's the way it is, you just share it. And what are your greatest memories of us as a family? But Christmas was always special. Christmas, Maybe we always Christmas had too. Nan and Grandpa staying with us, and they always came and stayed with us for Christmas. And Boxing Day, Uncle Clive used to come, and we had quite a big family gathering on Boxing Day. It was always a happy time. Easter's were always special with lots of family. And Summer holidays usually were just the four of us going away, always doing what we wanted to do. But I think one of the best holidays we had was in uh, um, Minorca, wasn't it? Our the first holiday abroad with children. The, uh, they were just old enough then, uh, starting with Cara, it was almost on the verge of swimming. <laughs> and, uh, she was living the, the whole day in the pool and Mark would just be following her in the pool, trying desperately not to drown himself. <laughs> he, was, he was one for sort of jumping in off the side and uh, trying to splash her and that, but she was desperately trying to swim and was almost, almost there by, by the end of the holiday. Well, she Following in her footsteps, he was trying desperately to swim, wasn't he? Cara learned to do the backstroke and uh, she did lengths and lengths of the pool mm -hmm. doing backstroke. And we thought she could have swum the English channel doing the backstroke. She loved it. Meal times. Meal times were all we spent together. Always enjoyed it. We were times together. Was there much difference between me and Mark, or personality wise, or were we quite similar? No, I think you were the. You quiet. were a lot more confident than he was. Yeah, you were the quieter one. He was always busy. Yeah, but it was more pleasures. Yeah. More. Uh, Used to climb everywhere, run everywhere. It was Harry was more sedate. Mm. I could sit you down with a book and you'd be there an hour later, whereas <laughs> Mark would be. You want to play with his toys or with his needs? leave no money to your children and just a set of principles, what would they be? As my parents told me, just be kind to one another. I think your honesty would have to figure very, uh, very highly, always be honest. and Always treat everyone with respect, yeah. as you would wish to be treated. Um, you mentioned Nana and Grandpa. Can I tell a story of um, the sort of interesting fusion in the family? Well, when 
dad and I got married, I had lost my dad and he lost his mother who we lived previously. So after we got married, Nana and Grandpa always used to come to us every Christmas. Nana being your mum. Yeah. Nana Grace always came to us and Grandpa Huey always came to us. And then all of a sudden we understood that my father's pal <laughs> was a, 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 a racy car. Uh, he was kind of seeing your mother no. and, and take, they, they, they'd go off for uh, trips in the car and my father would go along a chaperone because he was a pal. They'd always, all three go together. So anyway, anyway eventually um, Grace saw the light. She would have nothing more to do with uh, Albert. Albert, it was Ian Albert. Yeah. Uh, okay. She no, saw through him. Hilary thought, oh wow. Well. She's, <laughs> she's game for a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> So they carried on kind of meeting up and uh, next thing we understood. Ooh. Well, that we thought it was purely platonic. Mm. And then they surprised us by saying they were going to get married. So you hadn't suspected anything more than that before then? No, no, nothing no. at all. And four years after we would got married, our mum and dad got married. Which made you... Step brother and sister. Which have uh, teased many people. Uh, well, on we occasions. introduce each other, we say, I'm black too, he's my brother. <laughs> we just have to sleep together. <laughs> <laughs> and how did the rest of the family take it? Most were delighted, yeah. Not sure about my brother, Mark. Well, not so much him. Uh, his wife, I don't think uh, she thought much of the idea. But she, did, but she didn't. She didn't really understand the relationship anyway. She thought it was some kind of a setup. But, uh, that's what we always mm -hmm. imagine. Cause she would n never sort of visit them, spend any time with them at all even though they were frequently uh, called upon to babysit for them. And uh, there was always Mark who would take the children in to their house. She'd sit in the car outside. So there was obviously some ill, well not so much ill feeling, but uh, no feeling between her and uh, our parents. But anyway. That's the way things are sometimes in family but relationships. They had um, 22 happy years together. Very, very happy. Their companionship. They liked going on holidays together. As we said earlier, they always came to us. Special events. Mm. Yes. Um, I was just thinking about family meal times. What did we all used to like eating when we were together. Uh, your favourite was my curry and rice. <laughs> and Monday night's tea was either curry and rice, so it would be beef rissoles left over from the Sunday joint, which you always found very tasty. live your life again, what, if anything, would you do differently? I don't think I would change my life. I'm happily contented with the way life has turned around us. We're still together after all these years. Mm. And we have a loving family who care deeply for us. 
No, I don't think I would change it to my name. There's nothing uh, families could say, no. I think uh, you know, we're very fortunate in the family that we've had, but career wise, I think uh, on reflection, I might have uh, enjoyed a career in. IT more than uh, logistics, production, control that I spent my career in. Um, I had an interest when, uh, when I was at school because we had an opportunity to go to um, a university and sort of uh, do a bit of work on computers in very early days, a little bit of programming. And I had a, they realised I had a bit of an aptitude for it then, uh, but I never really followed it through. And uh, I've always had an interest in computers ever since, and it's always been a large part of my work, um, using computers and adapting computers in order to um, improve con production control systems rather than using bespoke things that you buy off the shelf. I sort of use and adapted um, things I've learned myself on computers. So if I had, you know, if I had a choice starting again, I think uh, I'd either have followed through and become a, uh, a pure engineer or I would have gone into IT. You, you wouldn't have changed anything about what you did? Um, maybe I would have tried to have gone to university, but uh, my family, nobody had gone to university in my family. And, was really encouraged, so. Yeah. I'm more than happy with the way my life turned out. Yeah. Worked in a school for 23 years in administration and always enjoyed it. And it was never dull or boring. Made lots of friends. Made you still got today? Made lots of long, lifelong friends. What are the funniest experiences you can recall that you've had? <laughs> well, I think the um, the one that we we laugh at the most was not all that long ago. It was uh, the holiday we had we back from holiday in Croatia, and we. We'd flown from Cardiff and on our return, we pre-booked um, our car park, paid for it in advance, so when we got to the airport we had to go through the barrier, so we took a ticket out, which Brenda carefully kept in her purse through the holiday. So as we came back through the airport arrivals, got to, towards the uh, exit and we could see the sort of car park ticket machines across the, uh, the hallway. So I asked her for the car park ticket and uh, went over to the machine, put the ticket in the machine and it came up on the screen to pay something like £105. So I thought, that can't be right. And then I thought, hmm, well, maybe it doesn't know that we prepaid. So we're trying to figure out what we do with no signs on the machine. So Brenda says, well, you've got to tell the attendant when you, when you leave the, the car park. Oh, hmm, maybe we do. So anyway, we jumped on the... Uh, car park coach, shuttle bus. the shuttle bus, 
and then uh, that had to drive out of the airport and back in another entrance. And in so doing, we went through the barrier, but there's no attendant there. So I said, hmm, that's not going to work. So I thought, let's put it in the machine in the car park. Make sure, because obviously that is a car, car park machine, just where we parked. So the ticket's got to sort of uh, be part of this sector. So you put the ticket in. Next thing, the machine comes up with a warning. This machine is not out of order. Oh, great. So there was a label on the machine. You know, if there's any problems, make this number. So got on the mobile phone, phone to say that the machine's out of order. To kept our ticket. So this kind of dopey voice said, I'll be there soon. So we stood and we waited and we waited and eventually in the distance we could see this guy waddling along. He must have been about 23 stone I think. And he wasn't rushing, you know, no concern of his. Eventually reached us. What's your problem? He said, I put a ticket in the machine. I saw it and it's come to this message. And uh, I have no faith in this guy. You can solve the problem. Anyway, he got this big bunch of keys and fiddled with the machine. He opened the machine and started filling the next thing. Out comes the ticket. Now, See, boy, this is the problem. <laughs> this is a car park machine. <laughs> this is your boarding pass for the plane. <laughs> <laughs> they don't work together. <laughs> well, I fell <laughs> so big. <laughs> so I said, okay, so uh, oh, I fit it in my pocket and Lo and behold, there was the car park ticket. I, I just put it in my pocket, the same pocket as the boarding pass. And I pulled the wrong one out. Anyway. So I said, what do I do now then? Uh, well, he said, you should have had that validated at the desk on the exit of the airport. So, so I had to walk all the way back into the airport so I went and found the desk and uh, I said, I understand I've got to validate this ticket uh, in order to, uh, it's prepaid, I've got to validate it before we can go to the car park. That's right, sir. So he went to fiddle with it and I said, <laughs> it would be, you know, it would be nice if you had some kind of a sign to at least warn people I said, I've been all the way over the car park. Warn people that the ticket's going to be validated here in the airport first. I like, can't work with your head, sir. <laughs> so I looked up and there's this sign about six foot wide in red and white letters above his desk saying, all prepaid tickets must be validated at this desk before you leave the car park. So within a space of 20 minutes, I was made to feel <laughs> that big twice. <laughs> you don't get things wrong very often, do you? I don't often get things wrong. Mm. <clears throat> Any others, Mum? <laughs> no, we leave it at that. <laughs> We've had a good few laughs in private. <laughs> <laughs> There was, the other, the <laughs> there was the other occasion where we did laugh. Mm. We were in um, Mallorca and we went to the bullfight. The bullfight. Mm. So this was an excursion trip. And when we got to the bull ring, we found our way to the very front seat. This is where we're on honeymoon in Ibiza. Was it Ibiza? Yeah. Uh, sorry, mixed them up. Anyway, the very front seat. 
and they were all it was was concrete steps which you sat on. And your mother had a clean skirt on that day, and she said, "I can't sit on that concrete. It's going to make my skirt all white." So I said, "It's not a problem. I'll take my shorts off." <laughs> Knowing full well that we'd been in the pool and I had my bathers underneath. So I stood up and I <laughs> dropped my shorts down, only to realise that they'd been back to the room and I changed my swimming trunks into my underpants, <laughs> which were in those days very fashionable net underpants. <laughs> string vest, like a string vest. What? <laughs> so there I was in my string pants in the front row of the ball ring. <laughs> and everybody wondered, what on earth is he doing? <laughs> oh dear. Not yet that before. No. Then I can That's tell not story. back 45 years. Mm -hmm. That story. <laughs> That's it, is it? Well, there was there was a story then <laughs> when uh, in um, uh, Jen, Jen and Graham, well, Jen's birthday party, wasn't it? And we were in this restaurant, yeah, it was in Swansea. In Swansea. Oh, okay. And we were on a table. There were fourteen of us all together, which was a big table, and they put us up. On a raised part of the restaurant, it was uh, a high step. Well, the, the restaurant was all very split levels, but we were put up on this this last step. And it came to the part of the evening where they brought the cake out. So Graham wanted to take Jen's photograph with the cake. And lo and behold, I was sitting next to Jen. He said, Russ, can you slide over so you're not in the photo? So I moved my chair. <laughs> I moved my chair over. I said, no, he said, you're still in the photo. Move your chair again. So I moved over a little bit. <laughs> so the next thing, he said, no, no, you still move over. So I moved my chair the third time, by which time two back legs went down the ledge, catapulted me to the lower level, where the t there was a table below us. I hit a guy sitting at the table, hit his back. He had just lifted a full pint of lager in his hand. <laughs> so I threw him forward and this pint of lager went into the lap of his pal on the other side of the table. Everybody was in stitches laughing. Apart from me, I was lying on the floor in sawdust. <laughs> Still attached to my chair. <laughs> <laughs> and this this guy uh, he didn't he didn't appreciate getting soaked at all. <laughs> he was ready to call it a bit of a mayhem, but uh, in the end it would be pacified him. But uh, yeah, some some event that. No stories from the squash club. <laughs> Good. Fancy There's a lot dress. of parties at the squash club. Yeah, so that's what you would afford to appreciate. Yeah, so plenty of fancy dresses where they once appeared as a nurse. <laughs> the lunch pack of Notre Dame. The, the lunch pack of Notre Dame. We really winky. <laughs> Have we talked too long now? <laughs> we're done aren't we mm. yes thank you for doing that i'm sure phil and bronwyn will love listening to that in the future and with their children as well <laughs> <laughs> thank you